The following presentation is brought to you by The Mutual Network. Better living through audio. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Chatterbox Audio Theater presents Argonautica, as told by Apollonius of Rhodes, Part 2. Come now, you muses, stand beside me and tell how it was that Jason returned the Golden Fleece to Iolcus, aided by the love of Medea. When we Argonauts docked in Colchis, King Aetes and his men were not the only ones watching. High above the land, amid the glens of Mount Olympus, in the blooming orchard of Zeus, two young boys were playing dice. Ha! I win again! Too bad for you, Ganymede. That means I take these as well. What will you do now, Ganymede? You haven't any dice left. I've won them all from you. Arrows. Mother! What is it? Ganymede and I were just finishing our game. Go home, Ganymede. You will never get the best of this greedy trickster. Yes, ma'am. Was that necessary, Mother? I've been winning the most beautiful golden dice from poor Ganymede. Eros, I come to you now not as your mother, but as a messenger from Hera herself. She has a task for you. Oh? Hera has taken an interest in the adventurer Jason, who with his crew has just docked in the land of Colchis. They will never convince the cruel King Aedes to hand over the Golden Fleece, not without our help. Yes, and what of it? What do you ask of me? Get on with it, please, mother. Aedes has a son, Absyrtos, and two daughters, Chalciope, who bore sons by the late Phrixus, and Medea. Medea is skilled in drugs and potions. With her help, Jason may well be able to obtain the fleece. Hare wishes to ensure that Medea will go against the will of her father and aid Jason in his quest. I see. So you would have me pierce her with an arrow and cause her to fall in love with this, uh, this Jason. Yes. Once her heart has been captured, her assistance will be certain. Do this without delay, and Hare and I will reward you richly. Reward me? <laughs> I have everything I could possibly want, mother. And if I don't have it, I can get it myself, as I just did with poor Ganymede's golden dice. With what could you or Hera possibly reward me? <gasps> oh. With this, Eros, a mere plaything, but one such as few have ever seen. This round globe was the toy of Zeus himself when he was but an infant in the caves of Mount Ida. When you throw it into the air, it shoots through the sky like a star. You will find no better plaything in the entire world, Eros, and it shall be yours if you complete this one simple task. I... I want it. It must be mine! Then do not delay. Fly immediately to the land of Colchis and do as Hera requests. And so, with his heart full of desire for the magical globe, the greedy Eros did just that. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Colchis, there was much excitement over the arrival of the Argonauts. This excitement echoed throughout the palace of the cruel King Aetes, where we travelers were bound. Medea. Come in, Chalciope. Medea, poor sister. Why do you sit here alone in the dark? You must cease this constant lamenting. You are young and beautiful. You are sure to have a rich life ahead of you here in Colchis. Hmm. Medea. Come with me to the court. They say that a foreign ship has docked this morning and that an army of heroes comes to pay tribute to the king. Oh? Such a group of men, I'm told, as has never been seen on this earth. Oh, come with me, sister. If anything can cure you of your malaise, I warrant you it shall be this. By that time, we Argonauts had reached the great hall of Aetes, the king of Colchis. We were introduced by Argus, grandson of Aetes, son of Phrixus and Chalciope, whom along with his brothers we had recently rescued. Grandfather, good king, 
I return to you after these many months, thanks to the men you see assembled before you here. Argus! Mother! Oh, Argus, you have returned to me, and each of your brothers as well. Come to me, my dear children. We had no word of you for so long, I was beginning to give up hope. Yes, mother. All four of your sons were shipwrecked on an island after our boat was destroyed by the clashing rocks. We might have perished there were it not for the arrival and the generosity of these men you see here before you. Oh, Argus, I am so happy! Away with you! Argos brings with him these strangers whom he says have business with me. But father... Away with you, I say. Now, you men, you rescuers, you come to our land with greed in your hearts and swords at your sides. What trouble do you intend to make for us? No trouble whatsoever, your majesty. As Jason stepped forward, all of the Colchians were dazzled by his grace, his nobility, and his beauty. Around his neck, he wore the brightly colored cloak given to him by Queen Hypsipyle on the island of Lemnos. It was about this time that the child Eris arrived at the king's court. He slipped in unnoticed and perched on a balcony until his eyes fell upon poor Medea. There you are. Hold still for just a moment, beautiful one. That's it. Now. <gasps> ah, simple as that. It is done, mother. I return now to Olympus so that you can follow through on your end of the bargain. Noble King Aetes, good Colchians, I am Jason of Thessaly, son of Aeson, and these are my men. We have traveled a great distance to meet you and to put forth to you our request. We are here to ask you to give us the golden fleece of Phrixus Ram. What? Do not misunderstand me. Though our strength is great, we come not to use force. We are eager to pay you ample recompense for this gift. What enemies threaten the safety of Colchis? We will help you subdue them. What fields require plowing? Which of your structures are in need of repair? We will aid you in strengthening this glorious city, howsoever you may choose. Good King Eetes, this is our offer and our request. Grandfather, these men saved my life and the lives of my three brothers. They have already proven themselves worthy of your beneficence. I beg you to heed their appeal. Oh, you do, do you, Argus? Be gone from my sight, all of you. It is clear to me that you have come to Colchis, not for the Golden Fleece, but to seize my scepter and my royal power. You count yourselves fortunate that Zeus protects all travelers and guests. Otherwise, I would have your tongues cut out and your hands hewn from your wrists. Then you leave us no choice. Peace, Idas. Noble king, I vow that we come to you with no treachery in our hearts. I have undertaken this quest to prove my worth as ruler of Thessaly. It is there I desire to sit as king and no place else. Do us this kindness, and Thessaly and Colchis will become the closest of allies. <laughs> you say you come to prove your bravery? <laughs> Very well then, prove it to me. I will give you the fleece to bear away to Thessaly once I have tested you. What trials would you have us endure? Oh, trifling ones, deadly though they may be. Labors that I myself have accomplished many times in my life. I have in my pastures two bulls with the feet of bronze that exhale searing flames. These bulls must be yoked and made to plow my fields. Two bulls? Is that all? We will subdue these creatures with great haste, King. No! The task must be completed by Jason alone. Then, once the fields are plowed, you will sow them, not with the corn of the meter, but with the teeth of a dread serpent, which I myself have collected. Immediately, these teeth will grow up into an army of warriors, and you must slay them all. Each and every one. I myself accomplish these labors within the span of a day. If you can do the same, you may have the fleece as you request. Look, it is a monstrous task, Jason. It is too much for one man. And yet the prospect of returning to Thessaly without the fleece is far worse. I accept your challenge, King. At the first light of morning, I will meet you at your pastures. And I will either accomplish these tasks or perish in the attempt. Medea? Medea! Child, why do your eyes fill with tears? Medea! Medea! Medea. 
Back at the ship, we Argonauts counseled our leader. Jason, your bravery in this matter is commendable, but even you must admit that the task that King Aegis has set out for you is impossible. Well, Jason, Jason, I have pledged my loyalty to you. Let me go in your place. I have lived through many dangerous adventures, and I have no fear of these creatures. You? Ha! Idis will accomplish these tasks without so much as a drop of sweat from my brow. Why, I shall yoke the warrior men as well and have them plow the fields. Do not listen to these others, Jason, who are brave but brash. I am fated by the gods to die far from home, and I have no fear left in me. Allow me to take your place. For us, Jason, we Boreads will carry out these tasks. And if one of us falls, the other will take up the challenge in his place. Let us go. Enough! Enough! Enough. You men have proven your bravery and your loyalty many times over. I cannot ask any of you to take this burden from me. If blood is to be spilled tomorrow, it must be my own. In the meantime, Jason! who approaches? It is Argos, Jason, along with the woman whom he greeted as his mother. Jason, you Argonauts, heed me. This woman is my mother, Chalciope, daughter of Aetes, wife to the late Phrixus. You will not like what she has come here to tell you, Jason, but I beg you to hear her out. Jason... My father, the king, has placed a terrible challenge before you, knowing that Zeus does not protect visitors who enter willingly into danger. Aetes lies when he tells you that he has accomplished the tasks he sets before you. No man can accomplish them alone. As it stands now, you will not live to see tomorrow's sunset. Be that as it may, I... Listen, please. I owe you the lives of my four sons, and for that you have my eternal gratitude. And so I have come to offer you the key to success in this challenge. Key? What key? My sister Medea is skilled in the arts of sorcery, Jason. With her help, you may perhaps stand some chance of defeating the fire-breathing bulls as well as the army from the soil. All your bravery will be useless unless it is supported by her magic. I thank you for this offer, Chalciope. But I cannot ask a young woman to break all loyalty with her father in order to assist me, a stranger? Even if she were willing, the consequences to her would be too terrible. But you must ask, Jason, for I saw poor Medea's eyes brimming with tears at the thought of your plight. I saw her affected by your presence in a way I have not seen her affected ever before. She is sure to offer her help, if only you will permit me to ask for it. Why, oh, why does this grief come upon me? He is nothing to me. Whether he is the best of heroes or the worst of charlatans, what does it matter? Let him go to his doom. And yet, yet. Medea, again, child, you are unhappy. But this is unhappiness of a different sort. Why is your cheek so flushed? Why are your eyes so red? Why do you wring your hands so? Oh, sister, sister, it is the terrible plight of those men. Our father will send the brave Jason to his doom, I know it. Would that I could do something to help him escape with his life. Perhaps you can, Medea. Me? But what can I do? Father would have me destroyed if he knew I even entertained such thoughts. Listen to me, Medea. With the help of Argus, I have already consulted with the heroes. If you will consent to it, the brave Jason will enlist your help in meeting the terrible challenges our father has laid out for him. In all your skill with magic and sorcery, you must have some spell, some potion that will assist him. Yes. Yes, I am sure of it. But, Chalciope, do you know what you are asking? Would you have me betray our own father? And what then will become of me? What disgrace will not be mine if I consent to aid these strangers as you suggest? If you would continue suffering under Aetes' cruelty, my sister, then that choice is yours. Otherwise, you must meet Jason after sundown at Hecate's temple and there supply him with the materials he needs to earn his victory. 
Do as you choose, my sister. But remember, no one can help those men but you. That night, Jason waited alone at the temple of Hecate, goddess of magic and of the crossroads. Hecate, the great Hera has watched over us on our journeys thus far. But if I am to win victory in E.T.'s pastures tomorrow, it will only be by magic. Therefore, along with Hera, help me and be my protector as I enter into the most dangerous of the challenges we have yet faced. Jason? You? You are Medea? Yes. I come to help you complete the tasks with which my father has burdened you. We must be swift. My attendants await me outside. They think I have come here to pray. I, I, I understand that you are wise in the ways of magic. I will be most indebted to you for any assistance you can give. With Hecate's guidance, I can help you. Listen carefully. The moment you leave this temple, you must travel to the banks of the Phasis, that tireless river. There, dig a hole in the ground and, in sacrifice to the gods, spill the blood of a young lamb. Atop that, pour a goblet filled with honey, bathe yourself in the river, and thereafter sprinkle yourself all over with this ointment. Coat your sword and shield with it as well. After you have done this, the flames of the deadly bulls will not burn you. Such magical protection is temporary. It will only last a single day, but one will be enough. How could I ever repay this kindness? Listen, there is more. As soon as you have yoked the oxen and with your might and prowess, you have plowed the fields and sown the teeth of the dragon, a terrible army will spring up from the earth and attack you. Before they overtake you, cast a mossy stone into their midst. They will fight over this stone like ravenous hounds, turning upon one another and destroying themselves. And then you and your men shall have earned the golden fleece as your reward, and you will be able to depart this land in haste. Gentle Medea, you have saved my life and ensured that I will return to my homeland in glory. I thank you for your generosity and your skill, but why are you doing this? For what reason have you agreed to help me? against the will of your father. Oh, do not ask me that. Just take the advice and the potions I have given you and be on your way. I want nothing in return from you save one thing. Name it, and it will be yours. When you are back in your homeland, where you will rule in peace and kindness, please. Every so often, remember the name of Medea. No. No? No, Medea. I will do much better than remember your name. When these challenges are met and we board the Argo to return home, if you will consent to go with me, I will take you to Yorkis and make you my bride. Jason! Do not say such things to a poor young girl like me, someone who will foolishly take them to heart. Take them to heart, and without fear, for they are true, as am I, Medea. But now, dear one, we must part. The night grows darker and I have many preparations to make. I will see you again when my terrible challenges are met. Until tomorrow? Until tomorrow. And so, Jason and Medea left the temple, each intoxicated by their sudden feelings of love for one another. Medea returned to the palace. After gathering the necessary supplies, Jason went to the banks of the Phasis River, where he followed Medea's instructions to the letter. The following day dawned bright and warm. The Argonauts and the Colchians gathered at King Aetis' pastures, where in the distance could be heard the terrible snorting and stamping of the bulls with bronze feet. 
And so, Jason, today we see what kind of hero you really are. With my son Absirtos by my side, I am prepared to bear witness as you willingly undertake the challenges I have set before you. King Aetes, I accept your challenges in the name of Hera herself, queen of the gods, and my protector. <laughs> Very well then, we begin. Remember, only when the bulls are yoked, the field is plowed, and the army of the earth is cut down, will you be worthy of claiming the fleece. I wish you much luck. Absyrtos. Yes, father. At Absyrtos' whistle, the two terrible bulls burst forth from their hidden lair beneath the earth and rushed toward Jason, who strode bravely in the field to meet them. Upon reaching Jason, the bulls attacked. Using his shield, Jason managed to deflect the terrible blows of their horns. That's the way, Jason! Don't let those little beasties frighten you! He fights with such strength, why? It is enough the bulls cannot even knock him over! Unable to wound Jason with their horns, the bulls flared their monstrous snouts and breathed forth jets of flame! Jason hid behind his shield, but the attack was so overwhelming that it was impossible for him to protect himself fully. Nevertheless, when the smoke cleared... He lives! He is not even wounded! As the bulls charged again, Jason reached out and grabbed one of them by its horns. He kicked the bull in his bronze foot, his own foot protected from pain by Medea's charm. The bull collapsed to the earth. Artis, the yoke, quickly! Jason took the yoke and bound the first bull, even as he used his shield as well as his bare hand to ward off attacks by the second bull. At length, Jason got a firm grip on the horns of the second bull and brought it to the ground in similar fashion. This Jason displays a remarkable strength, Father. He says he's protected by the gods. It seems more likely to me that he is one of them. You fool! He is no god! Can't you see what is happening here? The bulls are yoked, King Aetes! And yet your task has only just begun, Jason! The fields must still be plowed and sowed with the contents of this bag, the teeth of a terrible dragon! Onward, then! Still brimming with energy, Jason attached a plow to the yoked bulls and began driving them across the fields. Cha! Yeah. As the plow laid bare the earth, Jason cast into the furrows large handfuls of the dragon's teeth. For a moment, nothing happened. And then... A terrible warrior, armed with a sword and a shield, his flesh tattered, sprung up fully formed from the earth. And then another emerged, and another. Soon the entire field was crawling with these hideous creatures, armed with swords and spears, hatred blazing in their evil red eyes. Come now, Jason! Don't just stand there gaping! Attack! Attack! Jason fended off the creatures as he made his way toward the base of a hill at the pasture's edge. All the while, more and more of the warriors clawed their way out of the earth, their hateful stares fixed on Jason. Upon reaching the hill, Jason lifted a large mossy rock from the ground. With a mighty heave, he threw the rock into the field, where it landed amid the crowd of earthborn soldiers. Just as Medea had promised, the soldiers turned from Jason to the spot where the rock had landed. And then, with an incredible violence, they began to slaughter one another. The earthborn warriors cut each other down until only a single soldier remained. Seeing it flailing madly at the air, Jason stepped forward. King Aetes, the bulls are yoked, the field is plowed, the army of the earthborn lies slain. It is not yet even midday. I have met your challenges. Ah! Silence! Silence! I'm afraid yours is a lost cause, Jason. This victory is marred by treachery. You have disgraced yourself by using magic in order to defeat my challenges. But you have not acted alone. I know of only one person whose sorcery is strong enough to overcome these creatures. And she will answer to me, as will you all! You men, seize them! Seize them and take them to the palace! Seize me and you'll never seize another thing in your life! Jason, we are outnumbered. What do we do? Hold them off, men! We must reach the harbor! We must reach the Argo! Seize them, I say! Come on! Come on! Jason, there are too many of them. We cannot hold them at bay. 
Do not give up to this. We are making progress. If we can only break through. Redman! He has fallen, Jason! We are all in Menantippus are slain! And they are only the beginning of our losses. The Kukians fight fiercely. Do not give up, men! The path to the harbor is almost clear! Jason! Jason! Medea, come with me quickly! This way! Many brave Argonauts were slain in that terrible battle. After we broke through the Colchian line, however, began making our way to the harbor, the enemy army gathered their wounded and vanished in the other direction. They are rushing to their ports to prepare their ships. If they catch us, they will never let us out of this harbor. There is no time to lose. Jason, we must set sail now if we are to escape. We will not leave this country without the fleece. The fleece? Are you mad? We don't even know where it is. I know. I can take you there if you wish. You men, prepare to sail. Medea, once again we rely on you to save us. Lead the way. Medea led Jason deep into the Colchian forest until they came upon a dank, shadowy grove. And there, hanging from the branch of an enormous oak tree, they saw... Golden fleece. It is even more dazzling than I had envisioned. We mustn't lose a moment. I'll climb up and retrieve it. Take care, Jason. Remember, the fleece is not left here unprotected. Jason! The servant! Back, Medea! Get back! Great Zeus, it... It is enormous! Yes, Etis placed this terrible dragon here to guard the fleece. He put an enchantment over the creature so that it never sleeps. But, Jason, if I can apply this potion to the dragon's eyes, the enchantment will be broken and the beast will fall into a deep slumber. Its eyes? Well then, in that case, stand back. And with that, Jason rushed into the grove, past the open jaws of the mighty serpent, and leapt into its back. <laughs> The serpent writhed in a terrible fury as Jason clambered atop it, all the way up to its neck. Hold still, you! Medea's potions continue to protect me, oh, not for much longer! Jason wrapped his arms around the serpent's enormous throat and squeezed. The serpent shook, trying desperately to fling Jason from his back, but Jason held fast. Eventually, the serpent swung its head low toward that part of the grove where Medea was hiding. Now, Medea! Now! It, it's worked. The dragon is asleep. Yes, but not for long. We must hurry, Jason. Take the fleece from the oak tree and we will be on our way. Back at the harbor, we Argonauts were prepared to sail at a moment's notice. Already in the distance, we could see the approaching ships of Aegis' navy, led by his son, Epsirtus. We are here! Cut the anchor ropes! Jason, Medea, climb aboard, quickly! You first, Medea. Cut the ropes! Now roll with all your might. We must reach the mouth of the river and escape into the open sea. Brave Tiphys has fallen in battle, Jason. But Anchise has taken his place at the helm. And I know he will guide us with great skill. Now row, you men. Row! With the golden fleece in our possession, we sped out of the Colkin Harbor and up the Phosphorus River back toward the sea. The wind was in our favor, and the Argo moved as if propelled by a swift hand, perhaps the immortal hand of Hera herself. But... I am sorry to say, it was not enough. For as we neared the mouth of the river, we looked ahead of us to find... Aetes' warships. They have cut us off. We must have known a quicker path to the bay. Jason, what do we do? We stop, for the moment at least. We have no other choice. Stop! 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 Jason! Jason, listen to me! Clear path for us, Absyrtos. The fleece is ours, won justly in a contest whose terms were agreed to by all. We offer you no quarrel in that regard, Jason. I have permission from King Aetes to relinquish the fleece to you. It is our gift to the people of Thessaly. But we cannot let you depart with all of our treasures. We demand that you return to us my sister, Medea, whose treasonous actions must be punished. No, Jason, no! What is your answer, Jason? Well? 
Jason, you must at least consider it if she is the only thing standing between us and freedom. Idas makes a compelling argument, Jason. Not that I relish the thought of the girl being mistreated, but after all, we do have the fleece. All of you. How you look at me. From where did you unearth this hatred I see in your eyes? Has your triumph cast forgetfulness upon you? And so quickly? Oh, Jason, where are your promises now? Your honeyed words? For you shamelessly I have left my country, the glories of my home, even my family, and everything that was dearest to me. And yet, you would send me to my death in order to save yourself. Shame come to you, men. Yes, you have the fleece, but how did you win it? It was through my help alone. Even my father, the cruel king, can see that. And so he seeks to punish me in your stead. Jason, you swore to me that you were true. Are you? If so, prove it now or else with one stroke, shear this neck with your sword that I may never live to experience the misery I have helped create. But listen to me, all of you. If you dare return me to those bloodthirsty Colchians, then may you be racked with guilt and anguish for the rest of your days. May the fleece Vanish like a dream into the darkness, leaving you with nothing. And may the avenging furies drive you from your country and your homes as you have driven me from mine! Enough! Enough, Medea. You have spoken truthfully. If our quest succeeds, we owe our victory to the gods and to you. But we are trapped by E.T.'s navy. What other option do we have? I will tell you. Call to Apsirtos and inform him that you agree to his terms. Ask him to vacate this harbor and meet the two of us in the temple of Hecate, the same temple where you proffered words of love? Yes. And then? Hello, Apsirtos. Medea, you were late. Mm, I apologize. I was busy weaving an enchantment over your guards. There were very many of them, you know. You were taking no risks. Not to worry, Apsirtos. Now they are all sleeping peacefully. Medea, this treachery must end. How can you treat your family and your homeland with such cruelty? Where is Jason? He has sent me on alone. I suppose he has no desire to witness the torture of an innocent woman. Innocent? You've betrayed our father, your king, as well as the entire country. And you've betrayed me, Medea. There must be restitution. <laughs> there will be no restitution, Apsirtos. But I fear there will be vengeance. May the gods look with compassion on me in this my most desperate hour. You speak in riddles. I do. Absyrtos, I owe you one final apology. I have deceived you. Jason is here. What? <laughs> And so, with this terrible act, Jason and Medea purchased our escape from the land of Colchis. Of course, once the Colchian guards awoke and discovered what had happened to their prince, they sped after us in murderous pursuit. To atone for their actions, Jason and Medea prayed, made sacrifices, and begged for forgiveness. But the gods were not so easily pacified, and our ship was lashed by angry storms. Upon emerging from these storms, we discovered that we had been blown off course and that we were entering into a narrow channel that was home to two voracious sea monsters, Scylla 
and Charybdis. Hold on, starboard men! Go, go! Now! Oh, come on. The monster Scylla oh. had six long necks topped with six oh. heads, each of which contained row after row of sharp teeth. The channel she lived in was so narrow that by avoiding her, our ship was driven dangerously close to the other sea monster, Charybdis. Charybdis was a submerged creature who swallowed and belched out vast quantities of water, creating deadly whirlpools. Hundreds of sailors had been sucked down into her insatiable belly. We were saved from these two monsters by the sea goddess Thetis who, under direction from Hera, appeared with her sister nymphs to guide the Argo through the deadly channel. <laughs> Having survived this danger, we pressed onward, only to discover that the Colchians had avoided the channel of Scylla and Charybdis altogether and had managed to continue their pursuit. We rowed ceaselessly, day and night, taking shifts and sleeping only briefly. And yet, the Colchians remained close behind, a few days later, a small island appeared in the distance, and then softly, so softly, that at first we thought we had imagined it. We began to hear a most hypnotic sound. What? What is that? Is someone singing? The sound, it's spellbinding, like nothing I've ever heard before. It is the sirens. The sirens? Who are they? Deadly creatures, part woman, part bird, who lure sailors to doom with their hypnotic song. They will enthrall us and draw us toward their island where our ship will be dashed to pieces on the sharp rocks. How terrible. But I must say you are right about their song. It is indeed enchanting. I, for one, wouldn't mind sailing a little closer. In order to hear better, I mean. Yes. So long as we remain on our guard, I am sure we will be safe. And Caius, change course. We must. No! You fools! We have not come this far to fall prey to such a devilish trick. Orpheus! Oh, uh, my apologies, Jason. I, I was listening to the beautiful music. I know you well, Orpheus. If there's one thing I know about you is that you would sooner play music than to listen to it. A song, quickly, play as loudly as you can. Well, if you insist. What? Why are we slowed? The Colchians are still in pursuit. Jason, we have no time for this dawdling. I agree. Onward, men. Again, we sped away from danger, and again, by their great skill, the Colchian army continued to follow us closely. After several more days, however, we found ourselves in friendlier waters. We docked at a land called Drepane. The king of that land, Alcinous, received us with great kindness. I have heard of your quest, and I will do everything I can to aid you in completing it. Welcome, Argonauts. Our home is yours. When the Colchians landed in Drapane, however, they too approached the king. King Alcinous, we demand that the Argonauts turn over to us the Princess Medea, who in her wickedness slew her brother Absyrtos, and who used her magic to betray her father and her native land. Good king, please! In sending me with those men, you will send me to my death. I beg you, I did what I did out of uncontrollable love for the brave Jason for whom I would commit such acts a thousand times over. As for the death of Apsyrtos, my hand was forced by my wicked father, who would have condemned me to a fate far worse than my brother's. I have no desire to return to that evil land as long as I live. Please, good king, be merciful. Enough, enough. I must ponder on these matters, and I pray that the gods give me the wisdom to do what is right. You Colchians, I will answer your petition in the morning. For tonight, however, the Argonauts are my guests. So saying, King Alcinous treated us to a generous meal and to soft beds, the first time in many weeks we had enjoyed these luxuries. That night, as the entire palace slept, King Alcinous had what he first considered to be a very vivid dream. 
Awaken, Alcinous, son of Nausithous. I desire an audience with you. What? Who is there? Who speaks? I am Hera, queen of the gods. I come to you now to enlist your help. I have been watching over Jason and his Argonauts since the moment they began their quest, and I have great interest in seeing it through to its completion. Well, I admire the voyagers as well, Queen Hera, and in all things, I am your servant. What would you have me do? Listen closely, Alcinous, and I shall instruct you. The goddess then gave Alcinous a test for deciding Medea's fate. As Hera intended, Alcinous' wife, Queen Oriti overheard this conversation. Feeling great pity for the wretched Medea, she slipped from the royal bedchamber to awaken the Argonauts and tell us of Hera's commands. The goddess herself has appeared to my husband, the king. His decision on the morrow will be clear and swift. How will this decision be made? As instructed by the goddess, Alcinous will ask whether Jason and Medea are truly bound to one another, whether they remain two individuals, or have become one body that cannot be torn in half. The sign of this will be whether the two of you have yet shared a marriage bed. If by the morning Medea has given Jason her maidenhood, then the two of you are married in the eyes of Zeus, and Alcinous must send the Colchian army away empty-handed. You mean to say that, in order to escape, Medea and I need only share a bed? So it is commanded by the goddess. <laughs> and so, while the Argonauts renewed their celebration, the bold Jason and the fearless Medea excused themselves and bravely set about securing a victory in the last great challenge of our quest. King Alcinous was true to his word, and with Hera's help, we Argonauts departed his land safety. Eventually, after many other adventures, we completed our journey home arriving on the shores of Thessaly, wearied but victorious. All was not perfect, of course. The murder of the Psyrtos still hung heavily over Jason and Medea. The anger of the Furies would create much trouble for the two of them in the future, and I'm sorry to say, lead them both to rather unhappy ends. But that is a story for another time. For now, the revelry is underway, and as you know, nothing brings life to a party like a little music. You have been listening to part two of Chatterbox Audio Theater's live production of Argonautica by Apollonius of Rhodes, featuring Chris Jowers as Jason, Billy Pullen as Orpheus, Natalie Jones as Medea, Renee Kemper as Calciope, Joe Vescovo as Argus, Joe Carolino as Eetes, and Telemann, Odell Atkinson as Eros, and Apsyrtos, Abigail Amsden as Aphrodite and Arete, Jim Robinson as Idmon and Alcinous, Brent Morgan as Tiphus and Zetes, and Ross Williams as Idas and Calais. Music composed and conducted by Renee Kemper, violin by Anthony Gilbert, piano by Renee Kemper, oboe and English horn by Nathan Nix, and guitar and mandolin by Ed Richter. Sound effects coordinated by Bill Short. Script consultation by David Sick. Produced by James Antoine. Assistant directed by Tommy Harless. Adapted and directed by Robert Arnold. This is your announcer, Tom Badgett. Chatterbox Audio Theater is a nonprofit, web based community theater that advances the exchange of ideas by channeling creativity 
and artistic collaboration into recorded audio works that enlighten, entertain, and inspire. Download our shows, meet our cast and crew, and make a donation to support our work at www.chatterboxtheater.org. People just like you talk about their skin irritations. I have this skin rash. It really gets bad when it gets hot and my shorts ride up. It's a real bad itching, burning sensation. Uh, right where you don't want a real bad itching, burning sensation. I was going to my afternoon tea when this terrible itch started up. It was like there were fire ants in my bloomers. It started between my toes and it worked its way up to my knees. And before I knew it, my stomach was red, my chest was red, <laughs> even my neck was red. Man, that itch. That terrible itch. Itching, burning sensation. You may think there's nothing you can do about it. That's where you're wrong. Purple Planet introduces this three-volume audio cassette collection of people talking about their own terrible itching, burning sensations. Once you listen to them talk, you'll realize you're not so bad off after all. 90% of my skin turned bright red, then flaked off. Felt like the Dallas cheerleaders were going all over my body with belt sanders. Feel better? Purple Planet, Terrible Itching Burning Complainers, wherever fine recordings are sold. Also available in Disco Mix. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.